I'm going to talk to you about asset investment decisions that drive value and deliver the purpose. So by purpose, I mean the sort of purpose of, of our organisation. So you see line of sight from the decisions that we, we sort of make around investments to, to why we exist as an organisation. Um, so just introduce myself. Um, so yeah, Anglian Water. Um, we're a water company that operates in the east of, of England. Um, so maybe you sort of recognise the, the British Isles there and we operate um, in this region here and provide water and water recycling services. And by that we mean sewage services. Uh, so my role there is strategic value manager. Um, my role is all about sort of getting as much value from our, um, our business plan as possible through um, asset investment frameworks and decision making frameworks. Um, as sort of mentioned, I also work very closely with the IAM co-chairing patrons um, and I used to chair the IAM's next gen um, section sort of many years ago. So it's nice to sort of uh, join a next gen event. Um, so that's me. Uh, in terms of this session, um, I'll talk about how Anglian Water considers value in the broadest possible sense in, in the decisions that we make. Um, and we'll cover an introduction to Anglian Water and who we are, just so you get a little bit of a sense um, of, of who we are. Um, try and make this a little bit interactive and think about what, what you would do. Um, and to do that, we're going to try and use Slido. Uh, so on your screens, you'll see a, a QR code. Um, the idea is if you get your your phone, I don't know if you can if you can actually see me, but you get your phone and you open the camera app uh, and point it at the QR code and a link should should pop up and that will take you to Slido, which should just be blank at the moment because I haven't haven't activated the question. But if you have a go at doing that, hopefully it will work. If it doesn't work, you know, maybe we can just just use the chat or we can um, we can see how it goes it's always a bit of a risk trying trying something like this on one of these so yeah just give that a go there'll be another chance to scan the qr code as well if you if you miss that um so then i'm going to talk about some concepts something called six capitals which are kind of six lenses to look at value so we'll explore those a little bit uh, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the key things that help us to to drive value. So uh, a value framework, if you're not sure what one of those is, don't worry, we're going to explain it. Um, we'll talk about eyes open decision making. So using uh, using data and information to make the best decisions that we can. Um, should add a bullet point in there, really talk a little bit about investment optimization and prioritization, which uh, may or may not mention Copperleaf. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we can find more value and do a bit of a summary um, towards the end. So that should take us up to around around about um, 5.35, just trying to do the, the time conversion. Uh, OK, so a little bit about Anglian Water. Um, so we, we quite recently changed our purpose of our organisation and that's sort of why we exist. What, what's our sort of binding um, reason for existing as a company and our pump? purpose is to bring environmental and social prosperity to the regions we serve. Um, so there's a slightly better map there of, of the region that we serve within, um, within the UK there. Uh, a little bit more about the company. We are the driest region in the UK with about two thirds of the national average rainfall. So surprisingly dry, although sort of just looking out my window this morning, it <laughs> doesn't feel like it. Um, we've got about 38,000 kilometres of water mains um serve about seven million customers um through our region um one of the fastest growing regions in the uk so we're expecting another 175,000 homes over the next sort of couple of years um employ over 5,000 people although that's that's set to to double with the size of our investment plan that we've got um we've got for the next five year period between 2025 and 2030 so you get a sense of the the scale of the organization um, in terms of assets, we've got about 150 water treatment works, about 1,250 sewage works or water recycling centres, as we call them, and about 77 kilometres of sewers. So you get a, a sort of sense of the scale of, of the operation. Um, in terms of the, the context of the business, now, this could be true for, for any of the organisations we work with, and I'm, I'm sure I'm sure you'll recognise some of these things. But there's a lot of um, we operate in this sort of kind of uncertain environment with lots of, of, of challenges. You know, things change very, very fast. Um, the climate change is obviously something that that impacts on 
on all of us and impacts on our assets and the services we provide. Um, we've had a, a, a pandemic which has had a huge impact on um, on how we work, not only in how we work in, in terms of individuals and um, video calling and, and so on, but in terms of the impact of, you know, just being able to sort of get out there and operate assets and supply chains and that kind of thing. Um, financial constraints, I'm sure we're all, all familiar with this one. There's there's never enough money to do everything that, that we want, and that's always a, a, a challenge, and we have to sort of work within those. Um, customer expectations, they, they've changed a great deal over the past few years, in, in particular for us, sort of moving from being a silent service to being a service where people expect customer service in line with some of the leading customer service organizations within the country and with, within the world. Um, and people's expectations have, have massively changed in that area with access to social media and being able to, you know, sort of call companies out and, and write bad reviews and that sort of thing. People demand a, a, a better service. Um, demands of our regulators, and this might be new legislation or, um, you know, tightening of, of quality consents and that sort of thing. So we have to make sure we meet changing regulatory demands. Population growth, we've, we've already mentioned, and making sure our assets and services can, can keep up with that growth. Um, another one that's, you know, moving on leaps and bounds is cyber security. Um, being able to make sure our, our assets are resilient to any cyber attacks or even things as simple as you know phishing attacks from um, via emails and that sort of thing and just making sure that that our you know organization responds to that threat and of course there's the the changing markets both you know sort of um, regionally and and globally and the impacts that that has on has on our supply chain our ability to you know sort of um, resource the materials and the resources that, that we need. Um, so I'm sure lots of these factors um, impact on, on all of our organisations. Um, but with all of this kind of change going on, we need to make sure the money that we do have and the money that we spend goes as far as possible in terms of providing benefit to, to our stakeholders. So that could be customers, regulators, shareholders, partners that we work with, and, and indeed even our employees. Um, so hopefully that kind of sets the scene about why we need to spend money really, really wisely to respond to all of these external factors and, and benefit our stakeholders. So back in 2019, Angling Water changed our, our Articles of Association, which are kind of the documents, the, the legal documents that sort of set out what our company is about. We changed our purpose to, to bringing environmental and social prosperity to the regions we serve. We also changed our director's duties uh, and, and I've highlighted a couple couple of points there that that we consider the consequences of any decision in the long term. And also we consider the impact of the company operations on the community and the environment when we're making those decisions. Um, so some of what I'm going to show you is how we how we do that through asset investment planning. Um, so ultimately, we want to deliver the greatest added value that we can um, in lots of different areas and be able to evidence that we're doing so and making decisions in line with with our purpose and articles of association. So um, maybe that sort of sets the, the scene of the direction we're going. Um, so just going to talk a little bit about asset investment decisions and um, how we actually have a, a huge amount of decisions to make. So sort of starting at a very high level, you know, we've all got our strategic objectives as, as an organisation. Um, you know, for, for us, it would be things like reducing um, water supply interruptions, making sure our sewage works are adhering to their quality compliance, reducing pollution incidents, could be reducing health and safety incidents and so on. So each, each organisation will have a number of, of strategic objectives and there's a decision about well, how much money do I put into you know, achieving a performance level in those strategic objectives that's, that's something that, you know, that, that we want to achieve. Um, and we might use sort of current performance um, direction that the organisation want to take the, the company in, consider resource constraints and that sort of thing in making this decision. So it's very a very strategic decision. Uh, let's say then we've put some money in whatever strategic objective B is and we've created an investment portfolio um, for portfolio B. We've then got a decision to make about, OK, we might have a whole load of candidate investments that could help us achieve this objective. But hey, we haven't quite got enough money to go around to do all of them. So we need to figure out which investments we're going to proceed with and which ones maybe we, you know, we're going to put on on the back burner. Uh, and we need a method to make sure we choose the right selection of investments. Um, and so we've got decision making 
optimization and prioritization tools that help us do that. We also use something called a value framework, which I'll I'll talk to you about in a moment. Uh, and there are also various constraints that we need to consider within there. Just sort of going down another level, let's say we've decided investment number one makes the cut. That's something we're gonna gonna look into. There then might be a number of different options or a number of different alternatives in terms of uh, addressing whatever this issue is. Um, and we need a way to choose what's the best option for us. Um, and again, that's where we use some of the decision making tools and the value framework uh, and some of the, the challenge tools that I'm going to talk to you about. So today's talk will we'll sort of predominantly focus more on the, the right hand side here. Oops. Um, so if that that sort of makes a, a bit of sense about where we're going to we're going to focus on. Um, OK, so. Uh, we're going to have a go at this. I'm just going to make the Slido live and attempt to flick between uh, screens. So this might be a little bit clunky. So I'm going to start this this poll, uh, flick back to the slide. Um, so if you scan the QR code, hopefully you'll be taken to to a, a page where you can vote. Uh, and the idea is just to think about well, what would you do here? So I'll just read through this whilst you, you have a look. So. Three properties are flooding uh, once every two years. Um, there's also a risk that there could be a moderate pollution event every five years. There's also a moderate health and safety incident that happens around the site um, roughly every year. Uh, and you want to do something about this. You're not you're not sort of happy about this situation. Uh, and so you've got three options to consider. Um, option one prevents any future flooding, health and safety or pollution incidents. So loads of benefit, but it costs a million pounds uh, in capital expenditure. It doesn't cost anything to run, but it's got a lot of carbon. So, so a few pros and cons. Uh, option number two reduces the risk of flooding, health and safety and pollution to about a quarter of the original level. So, you know, 75 percent reduction in, in risk um, also provides um, an additional benefit of improving employee productivity. So that might be might be attractive. Uh, this one costs 600K up front, but 5K a year to run, but is low carbon. Uh, and then option three here solves the flooding and pollution risk completely, but only halves the health and safety risk. Um, and there's an additional disbenefit that it's going to be a bit of an eyesore uh, in an area of natural beauty. So people aren't really going to look like like looking at this. Uh, quite cheap, costs 250k, but quite expensive to run. So 25k a year to run and somewhere in the middle on the carbon. Um, so have a look at these and vote on Slido uh, about which one you think you're going to do uh, and then we'll come back to it later and apply Anglia Mortar's value framework and see if it if it helps us to make a decision so um, I'm just sort of pausing uh, I might have a quick look at the Slido okay so we've got some we've got three votes coming in uh, so you can see you can see how others have voted but but do have a look and do vote for um, do vote for something different if you if you want to um, okay I'll just leave it just a second longer um, looks like we're going to get going to get three votes on this one. OK. Um, all right, so we made a decision. Um, I'm going to change the question to. How did you choose? What was the most important factor um, in making that decision? So um, was it about cost? Was it about benefit? Maybe carbon was the most important um, measure. Maybe you sort of tried to weigh up a bit of everything or you just went, oh, you know what, I'm just going to pick one at random. Um, so have a think about what was what was the most uh, important decision making factor. Um, you've got four votes coming on this one. Um, so a bit of a bit of a mixture. Some of you did the sort of trying to weigh everything up. Others went, yeah, you know what, cost cost is most important. You know, and let's be honest, cost is uh, is, you know, a, a massive constraint that we have. So. Um, Cool, that's quite a few more coming in there. Uh, excellent. I'll just leave that running a little bit longer. Um, it's a bit of a range of bit of a range in there. It's great to see this this happening live. Um, cool. Thanks for thanks for engaging with that. Um, it's a bit of a mixture, but most people, about two thirds, sort of tried to work the pros and cons, and others, you know, had some um, some factors that were sort of the most important. Um, so, final question, if I can, uh, if I can hit play on this um, it's just how did you find that exercise so what did you what would how did you sort of feel as you were having to make that decision and um, there should be a text box on the screen um, and you can just put a word in there about maybe how you felt whilst you were doing it or how you found it you know maybe you, uh, you found it difficult or there wasn't enough information or um, maybe it was fun or 
<laughs> maybe you found it boring you know i i don't know so uh so stick a word it's challenging excellent someone's first first to go it's always easier when someone else has been um so yeah just think about how 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 you found that so gut feel yeah so someone went with gut feel uh found it fun so sort of nice nice mixture i'll just leave this running a little bit longer in case there's any any more in there have a sip of my coffee interesting interactive cool okay so so thank you for that so that, that the idea of this is that um you know we're faced with making decisions like this on on a daily basis and you know all of these sort of words that you put in here are, are absolutely true it's, it's challenging you know we enjoy it that's why we're in asset management right we, we sort of we find it interesting we do find it fun um gut feel you know great have put that thank you for your honesty um because let's face it sometimes we are we are basing decisions on gut feel due to a sort of lack of of any any better data you know, and just sort of popping back to to this uh, this last multiple choice question it's not going to let me show it um but the how we make those decisions is is often quite different it can be different within our own organization some people you know are focused on cost other people are focused on benefits others are trying to you know weigh everything up if you've got a carbon department you know they're very interested in in carbon i've got another interactive oh that's nice it makes the makes that word bigger um so hopefully you sort of get get the sense that um this can be difficult. Um, it, we can have sort of conflicting or competing uh, priorities within that. Um, but we want to get the most value from these decisions. I think that's probably something we can all agree on. Um, so I'm just going to pose the question, what is value? And I really like this definition of value in this, this sense. So the relationship between the benefits and the resources required to achieve them. So by benefits, that might be the improving health and safety and pollution, et cetera. And the resources required could be the financial resources. They could be the natural resources. They could be, you know, people required, to, uh, sort of, you know, the workload required. Um, so I always like to have this definition in mind. Um, just thinking about value uh, a, a little bit further, are uh, um, these six capitals that I talked about. And these are really six lenses to think about value. Um, and I'll just run through these fairly quickly because uh, I'm conscious of time. Um, so natural capital, this is all about the impacts we have on the environment, including carbon. Um, social capital, these are the impacts and relationships that we have with um, our customers, wider society, communities. Uh, manufactured capital, this one can sometimes have slightly different definitions, but we see it as our direct product. So the, the water effectively that is a product that, that we sell and also our ability to provide a resilient service. Financial capital, one we're probably quite familiar with. So, you know, cost and financial health. Um, people capital. So are our people safe? Are they happy? Have we got a good culture? And then finally, intellectual capital, which is kind of intellectual property, but also the way we we work, data processes, that kind of thing. So when we're thinking about unlocking value in the decisions that we make, we, we might tend to focus on financial value because that's you know that's been around for a long time maybe some of our organizations are starting to think more about natural and, and social value but really we want to think about value in the broadest sense and consider consider all of these um all of these areas uh, and we're not saying that you know one is necessarily more important than the other so how do we do this in practice so this is really what i want to uh want to get to is there there are a few a few things we can do to help us help us do this so one is a value framework uh, another is making eyes open decisions another is use of prioritization and optimization tools uh, and then the final thing is around putting some challenge process in place to help us find even more value so i'm going to run through these but it'll be it'll be fairly quick so what's a value framework? Um, some of you may have come across one of these before. Uh, essentially, what a value framework allows us to do is express different risks, different benefits, different benefits in a, a common language so we can start to compare them. Um, we use pounds as a common language, but this could equally be Anglian water beans or you know a different unit. Um, but pounds is is probably the easiest unit, or you know, it could be euros or um dollars or uh, any any other currency that, that you choose. And so the idea here is that you compare can compare a pollution incident with an internal flooding incident with a load of leakage. 
with income you get from selling bioresources, with health and safety events, with employee productivity. So very different um, kind of benefits and disbenefits, but we can start to compare them. And this allows us to then think about, all right, well, if we can monetize them and put them all in the same language, then we can make choices about which investments we choose or which op options we choose. So this is Anglian Water's value framework, um, a, a sort of top level, and you can see all the different um, categories of benefit that sit within there. Few few key features of this, um, if you're going to sort of creating your own, is these. You'll notice none of these are at asset level. None of them talk about broken pipes or broken pumps. They're all at the outcome level or the service level. Um, so this is something a customer or a regulator or the environment would notice. Um, we when we've developed the actual values, we've included a societal value, which is um, which is sort of customer preference. So if customers tell us leakage is more important to them than flooding, then that will that will achieve a higher value. Uh, and a really key point here that the the valuations that sit behind this were developed with experts and data from over you know, 110 people across our business with industry and academic research. So this isn't something that I'd advise creating in a dark room with with one or two of you, you need to sort of do it collaboratively and involve experts from around the business and that will help with buy in. So people buy into the decisions that this this can drive rather than it being something that, you know, was created in the strategic asset management department and no one was involved in. Um, so let's have a look at, at what would you do and revisit it using Anglian Waters value framework. This looks a bit spreadsheety, um, but but bear with me. Um, so we, we've used our value framework to um, to assess the situation that we had in the first place and come up with a kind of baseline position of, of risk. Um, we then got our three different options and we've analysed um, what that will, what each option will do to uh, to the baseline position. We've added some carbon information in um, and we've added some cost information in here uh, and we've done the same for for each option, we've also added in our additional benefits and disbenefits. Um, I should point out that this is a, a spreadsheet approach to doing this. We also do exactly the same thing in our investment optimization and prioritization tool, which is which is Copperly. Um, so from this, this drives something called a value index, which is kind of essentially a, a, a very crudely a payback period. The lower the number, the better. Um, and that kind of tells us um, in crude terms what's the best value um, option here. Um, so I'm going to pull up some tables. Uh, so this is the table that then then is kind of spat out the back end of this that um, that presents the information. So we can see option two here is winning on best value. So if you picked option two, you can feel, you know, pleased that you uh, you, you picked the best value one. Um, but that's not always the whole story. So, you know, there are other factors at play here. So someone mentioned benefits was the most important. Uh, decision making factor to them. Um, so in this case, option one, you know, might be the winner because it's got the most benefit, whereas option three, you know, doesn't. Maybe it was cost. You know, someone mentioned that that cost was the most important. So if it was just capex cost, then maybe option three is is the winner. But what we're really encouraging people to do is to consider all of these factors together. So and let's be honest, cost is often the one that that gets us. But if we're making a decision that we're going with option three here, that, that we've only got, you know, the 250K to spend, then we we know the extra risks that are being carried. Um, and this visualisation here just shows the benefits and disbenefits of each option. So we can see that option one here has some big social benefits some big people benefit. Um, it's got a little bit of natural disbenefit. We can see with option three, there's there's a bit of disbenefit in terms of financial, social and natural disbenefit. And these little diamonds here show the net benefits position. So this is these tools are to help us make informed decisions rather than necessarily, you know, maybe we default to the cheapest one. But then we look at this and go, oh, you know what? Benefits position here is is actually quite poor. You know, can we find the extra money to go to um, to the best value option, for instance? Um, so these decisions are are informed. Um, this helps us to measure benefits. So once we've sort of made a decision, we can measure the benefits of, of each option. Um, and I'll just move on. This helps us track the benefits through our investment program. So our investment process has a number of milestones, which are these these DMs here. And we, we skip a couple for measuring benefits. Um, and this allows us to see what benefits we're planning 
early on in the process, um, what benefits we're realising at the end of the process. I should just stress this dashboard is a work in progress in case you're wondering why they go up and down um, quite so much. But that allows us to track whether we're actually delivering the benefits of the programme that we set out to and ultimately whether we're delivering on on the purpose of, of environmental and social prosperity. Uh, a couple of other things that really, really help us in this space is, OK, well, the example I've shown shown you is kind of OK, that's great for an individual project. But what about when we've got thousands of potential projects? And this is where uh, we use Copperleaf to help us um, prioritise and optimise what we're what we're going to do. Uh, one of the great things about Copperleaf is the ability to to use constraints. So if we've got all of these potential projects and we only know we've got you know, a certain amount of cash or we know we've got a, a level of performance that we want to achieve, we can put that constraint in and the the system will sort of organize the projects in the best possible way um, to achieve the most benefit in line with that that constraint um, so the other sorts of constraints that we can consider might be the resources we've got available and, and a minimum and a maximum level and again we can sort of optimize the the investments based on based on those resources. So you can use lots of different constraints in here. I've just just put a couple in um, to give you a sense of, of how this can work. Um, some other areas to think about. So we, we've talked about how we measure value using the value framework, how we make good decisions um, and how we optimise um, a, a at a portfolio level. That's all well and good. But what about finding more value in, in the first place? So these are some tools that we put in place within our investment process. So, so this is our investment process kind of end to end with the, these are kind of stop go gates. Uh, and these purple arrows are something we call um, a risk opportunity and value process. And the idea of that process is to sort of collaboratively explore and make best value, value choices and recommendations. Um, so we've, we've added some tools in uh, to these ROV workshops that we hold to really help us um think about value in the broadest sense um so so here are some examples uh, and i'll just just build all of these so you can have a read through i'm not going to read through all of them but th these are some of the things that we might do as a result of of the new challenge tools we put in place so um maybe we choose a, a location on a site that has a minimal impact on biodiversity or we reduce the footprint or we instead of just leaving the, the land as it was, we plant some wildflowers to in, improve the biodiversity in the area. Um, my personal favourite on the social capital is if we're putting some noisy plant on a site, maybe during construction or permanently, we position it as far away from, from neighbouring homes as, as possible. Maybe we plant some some trees to improve the view or um, this is one you know I really like that we ask the local community on, well, you know, what should we call this new new asset that we've built? Manufactured capital, um, we had a great example where um, we put an electrical panel on the north facing wall of the building and in, in the UK, north facing walls are typically cooler than south facing walls. Um, and so it was a bit more resilient to high temperatures um, that we do sometimes get here. Um, so financial capital, maybe we can raise finance through um, uh, community funding or partnership funding or through different different bonds um, in terms of people capital, uh, is there anything we can do to improve, improve well-being? So a really good example we had recently was we were out at a site uh, spending millions of pounds improving the assets. And whilst we were there, we just installed a, you know, a, a toilet facility. So when people are visiting, you know, they've got uh, they've got a toilet to go to and that improve improves their well-being. So quite a simple thing, um, but, but worth doing. Uh, and then intellectual capital, is there some new technology that we can use? You know, can we partner with a with a third party or or bring in some learning from somewhere else? So so by having these sort of prompts, we might find different ways just to add a little bit of extra value in in different places um, as, as we go through. Um, so in terms of, sort of following this approach, um, number of sort of high level benefits. So line of sight between purpose and the decisions that we make on the ground getting more value from our investment plan and the, the, the money that we've actually you know got to, to do these things helps us to reduce carbon um we by include you know something i didn't talk about too much was in, including costing um sort of carbon costing if you like in in our decision making process um and this also helps to improve um the visibility within our delivery partners about 
what we want to do and the sort of challenges that we face and uh, again provides evidence that we're actually delivering on our on our purpose um a few more bits and i'm conscious of time i'm just going to overrun by a couple of minutes uh so in terms of where we're going with this and, and what we're going to do uh next we're putting in place a kind of benefits review process that allows us to determine whether our investments have actually delivered the benefits intended now this might seem like a, a relatively straightforward kind of asset management thing to do but typically we finish a project um, and then we get really excited about the new project uh, that we we're moving on to and we maybe don't spend as much time thinking about did we deliver the benefits as we thought about did we deliver the thing and they're, they're often very different um, so it's worth spending time here and that's that's something we're working on and uh, we're also working on building this into our supply chain's performance framework so currently our supply chain is incentivized on capex and on time um, however maybe we should put a bit more incentive in place around you know the delivery of benefits uh, and something that isn't on this slide is we're working all of this up into a an external facing purpose dashboard which allows us to um, articulate to our external stakeholders whether we're delivering on our purpose or not um, so there's quite a lot of exciting stuff happening uh, off the back of this Oh yeah, there we go. It is on this slide. <laughs> I, did, I forgot about the build. Um, so I've added in here a whole load of learning, and I, I won't run through through all of this, but the slides will be available um, to have a look through. Uh, I think what I, I would pick out here is that this might look, you know, quite complicated. We've been on this journey for for a long time, um, but the best way to get started at this is is just to get started um, and start to create something that you can use and then refine it uh, and move on. So don't let don't let great be the enemy uh, of good here. And as you're developing that, involve as many people from your organization um, that are going to be using this or that are informed as as possible. Um, I think the final final piece I'll pick out here is we can get very hung up on the metrics, the valuations, the specific numbers, the number of decimal places, but often the conversations that you have are, are more valuable than is it 1.15 or 1.16. So, so don't get sort of hung up on perfection. Um, my final thought then, uh, I'll share an example with you. Um, this is a, a sewage works or water recycling center, as we call it, called in Goldisthorpe. And we had a new a new quality consent here. So we had to treat this water to be um, a, a better quality than it currently was. What we typically would have done is bought some land here and built a big concrete treatment tank and treated it and stuck it back in the, the river, which sort of runs runs along here. You probably can't see it too well. Um, hopefully you can see my pointer because otherwise it might be a bit tricky. Um, but anyway, that's what we typically would have done. Um, but what we did instead is we created these these lagoons and this this photo was taken just when they were built. They're now, you know, full of sort of biodiverse plant life and, and so on. So the the water comes off the sewage works and it moves through these lagoons and is treated naturally. Um, so it's, this is all about um, phosphorus removal. And so then that goes back into the river sort of over over here somewhere um, and it achieves the same outcome in terms of treating the water to a, to a better standard, but it achieves it in a natural way. Um, so this obviously has some natural capital benefits in terms of biodiversity and, and carbon, um, but it's also created a bit of a sort of community resource so we involved a local community in sort of opening it and um and sort of getting involved in it so it's, it's a lot of social capital there it's also a nice place for our um for our site operators to you know sort of go and have their lunch so there's some some people capital in there uh it's more resilient to to climate change so there's there's benefits across the capitals um so my, my sort of thought is we know we can do this um so let's try and do it more often let's try and do it every time and yeah hopefully there's a bit of bit of food for thought there so um just want to say thank you for listening apologies for overrunning uh by a few minutes uh my email address is on the slide if you if you do want to get in touch um but i think we've got maybe got some time for some questions there so i'll i'll stop sharing and just pause so yeah thank you thank you very much for that um john um looking at the chat we don't have any questions yet um but let me maybe warm people up and, and kick off with one um in in the five or so minutes that we have oh we do have one um literally just come up now uh, i'm going to read it as as it is 
um, cost or benefit. Often cost overcomes benefit because accountants have a strong hand in the financial decision. Do you think this ancient culture might change with AI coming to play soon? Fantastic question. question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I, I totally, you know, share the same, um, the same sentiment that that cost is often, you know, our most important decision making factor. And, you know, for for a reason that there's there's only so much money to go around. You know, we're we're all asset managers, and you know, when we're running our household budgets as well, we're thinking about, oh, you know, how much is this going to cost? So, the the constraint of cost, I don't think, is going anywhere. But I do think there are more opportunities with with technology and with AI to to make more of that money uh, and to use that money more wisely. Um, so I think we might start to see a shift that says, you know, making this decision that reduces capex in the short term is actually really not a long term decision, and maybe there are better ways that we can we can use our our cash. Um, but if we put that alongside of maybe looking at different sources of funding as well, then maybe we start to unlock, you know, some different opportunities and be a little bit more benefit driven in the decisions that we make rather than just sort of defaulting to to CapEx, which I'm sure frustrates many of us. So, yeah, good, good question. And, um, you know, lots of lots of opportunity. Thanks, John. Um, we do have a, a few more minutes before we move on to Dr. Masti's uh, segment. Um, so I'd like to pick up on, on a point that you made on your learning slide. You know, the best way to get started is, is get started. Um, and, and I guess my question for uh, for the audience to consider as well is how did you get started, especially on creating that, that value framework? Yeah, great, great question. And I think sometimes when I when I show organizations that value framework and they go, you know, this is a, this is a long way off. We we don't have one of these. Um, we actually started probably about 16, 17 years ago with this. And the first thing that we did is we wrote down what are all the, the sort of outcome level um, services that we provide. So things like um, supply interruptions is something that could frustrate customers, health and safety pollution, compliance. Um, so those key services um, that we provide. Uh, and then what we did is we got um, some small groups of experts together that knew about those. So let's take pollution, for example. And we said, all right, when we have a pollution incident, um, what do we do? What's our response to sort of put that right? And we wrote that down that, well, we go and clean it up and we would have to file a report and maybe there was a fine. So we wrote down what our response was. And then we tried to put some costs to that. So we said, all right, cleaning it up. We've got some data. Typically that costs us, I don't know, £20,000, for instance. Typically the fine is £100,000. Um, and so we used the, the expert judgment and data to then sort of add that up to create a, a value um, that we were then able to start using in decision making. Um, and that's really where we started. Now we we have, you know, expert consultancies that come in and do lots of stakeholder consultation and create, you know, societal values as well as the the sort of the private values that I've just talked about. But it is something that, you know, you can get started with and you can start to create and then refine as you go through time. Um, so our first ever value framework was, you know, sort of created in house. It was relatively sort of simple compared to what we've got now. But did it help us make better decisions? Absolutely. You know, it was a it was a step change at the time. So, yeah, my advice is to sort of get started. And if you want um, want any tips, you know, give me a shout. OK, um, we've got another question. It's probably going to be the last question before we move to the next segment. Um, it's to what extent uh, did ISO 55001 prove to be a game changer for your organization? Yeah, great question. So so for our organization specifically, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial, um, we, we already had a standard called PAS 55, which was sort of a forerunner to ISO 55001, which was a, a, a British um, standard. And we we took a decision not to go for PAS 55 until we felt we were mature enough. So ISO 55001 was was just sort of 
business as usual to some extent when when that came in and we were one of the first companies in the world to to achieve 55001 um however 55001 has the potential to be an absolute game changer to to organizations that are sort of towards the beginning of their asset management journey um but what i would say with 55001 is is focus less on getting the certification and less on the sort of piece of paper that you get at the end of it. And it's more about the journey. And 55,001 is often the start of the journey. So the, the outcome is to, to improve the asset management capability of the organisation. And the certificate is something that you sort of pick up along the way. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Perfect. Um, thank you, John, and bang on time as well. Uh, and that's a, a good segue, actually, to... Um, to the close of, of this session. Uh, we are now coming to uh, the end um, of this first IAM Malaysia Next Gen session. Uh, so thanks again to our speakers, John Green, uh, and also to our virtual audience for joining us. And uh, see you at the next event. <laughs>